So, let's talk about chaos. In part six of The Love Letter, I brought up how the quality of writing in season two begins to degrade and fall apart past a certain point, and that degradation is just incredibly important to understand, because it's what creates the death spiral that would ultimately be the doom of both of SNO's two movies. Like, when we start talking about those and I pause for a second in between suicide attempts, you might think, holy shit! How did it get this bad? Well, it started here, and it's because of this. Because of chaos. From pretty much this point onward, Chaos's mere existence becomes the crux of the story, which makes her a fantastic lens through which we can examine both the rest of the series as a whole, and more specifically, how she ties into the downfall of the anime. So, Let's talk about chaos. But not yet. You see, the issues present in the anime's writing are a direct result of changes made by AIC Asta and Kadokawa to the source material and to chaos's character. So before we can talk about chaos, we need to look at how Soro no Tashimono the anime compares with Soro no Tashimono the manga. So let's give you guys a bit of context. The SNO manga has 77 chapters, and the first season of the anime covers it to about chapter 17, and then Forte went on to cover it until chapter 33... sort of. Around episode 9 of Forte, little things start changing here and there. Small additions that were never in the manga, and that specifically was a first for the anime. I mean, there had been changes in the past, but they usually only involve shuffling the order certain chapters took place in, and I could literally spend an hour just giving you guys examples of that. If you watch the anime and then read the manga, you'll find the initial 20 or so chapters are almost entirely told out of order. In the manga, for example, Nymph doesn't even show up until the Christmas episode, but the Christmas episode is also told way earlier than it is in the anime, coming before the Tomoki Bathhouse episode. But the best example by far is the OVA. So episode 13 adapts chapter 15, but then episode 14 adapts chapter 27. But all of that still works because the changes are being made for the sake of narrative pacing in a different medium, and because they put a serious amount of elbow grease into rearranging them so that it all still made sense and flowed coherently. And if they ever did make an actual change, it was usually a relatively minor alteration that didn't impact the ongoing narrative any. For example, the Uranus system, Ikaros's big final form battle mech, isn't actually a thing in the manga, as Ikaros' main weapon there is Hephaestus, a giant laser cannon, which, by the way, did actually make a cameo in episode 7 of Forte. So, like I said, the SNO anime was no stranger to changing small details or shuffling things around here and there, but this was the first time the anime creators were flat out adding something that wasn't in the manga. An original creation tacked on to what had previously been a very faithful straight adaptation of Suma Nozuki's opus. And you might have noticed my use of the words tacked on in that last sentence, and that's gonna take some unpacking. But unfortunately, that will have to wait. Because before I can tell you how they fucked up, you need to know who they fucked up. But for right now, let me be clear. I don't have an issue with the idea of making changes to an adaptation, of a director adding their own visual or conceptual style onto a work. Granted, I might question why they would start doing that 20 episodes into an otherwise mostly word-for-word -word adaptation, but hey, I'm not against the concept. I don't have a problem with the idea of the anime making changes to the manga's source material. What I do have a problem with, though, is making changes that COMPLETELY FUCK UP THE STORY! So, let's talk about chaos. This might be hard to believe, but Nymph is not my favorite character in SNO. I've been saying that she's my waifu for years now, and yes, she is a fucking amazing character and one of my favorites, but she's not the best character. I know, crazy, right? Now, 
the particular distinction of the best character goes to the first of the second generation angeloids, type Epsilon Chaos. So, the first thing worth mentioning about Chaos is what an amazing job Suma Nozuki does of building her up. I mean, previous villains like Nymph and the Harpies had always just sort of showed up whenever the manga needed a jab in the right direction, but the anime actually devotes a lot of time to building up Chaos's arrival. Episode 5 of Forte ends with Chaos walking out of a tube in typical clone fashion, her face hidden by shadows, and creepily asking Minos, can we play a game? And smash cut to black. Then in episode 6, we have a scene where Minos literally flies over to Daedalus' house just to brag about how awesome Chaos is. He tells her, The first second generation angeloid has been perfected. Infinitely more advanced than your measly first generations, her destructive power alone is unfathomable. Visibly shaking, she asks what he's going to do with her, and he responds, Isn't that obvious? Alpha and Beta will be obliterated. Episode 7, then, is our first official introduction to Chaos. The episode begins with a shadowy version of Chaos showing up in Tomoki's dream and tormenting him. Now, keeping in mind we've already been told at this point that dreaming is this super amazing thing that is supposed to be impossible for angeloids, the fact that she has the capacity for dreaming displays just how far advanced Chaos really is. And then, throughout the rest of the episode, we get brief scenes of just building up Chaos's arrival, and these bits are genuinely unsettling, to the point where even these few scenes hang a veil of unease over the entire episode. Like, I love this one right here, where Chaos happens to walk past Mikiko, and despite how Chaos is using her anti-perception system, Medusa, to edit out Mikiko's ability to see her wings, they're still clearly visible in her shadow. And the way this shot's framed, being reflected off a street lamp, is again a really clever way to communicate that sense of unease. The message is clear. Chaos isn't just a throwaway villain like the Harpies were. She's a big deal, and she is coming. Like I said, just a fantastic job building her up to be a real credible threat. And she totally pulls through with that. Once again making use of Medusa, Chaos disguises herself as Tomoki, and under the guise of inviting her on a date, leads Nymph out away from town. You see, Chaos was ordered to both kill Ikaros and Nymph, and to take the Variable Wing Core back to the Synapse, but we find out that she doesn't really care about any of that, which is insanely weird because this is the first time we've seen an angeloid directly disobey their master's orders. So, instead of doing what she was ordered to do, she has one simple question that she wants answered. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Yeah, and thus a million memes were born. Most of which don't include chaos for some fucking reason, but whatever, not the point. Anyways. Love was apparently enough to make both of them betray the Synapse, but angeloids shouldn't be programmed to feel love, so Chaos wants to know what's up, and she decides the best route to that answer is to literally beat it out of them. Chaos uses Medusa again on Nymph, showing her phantom images of her friends insulting and torturing her. Nymph, you're a wingless failure. Nymph, Tomoki will never love you. Nymph, you're going to be scrapped. And this ordeal reduces her to a crying, huddling mass on the ground, completely incapacitated and helpless. But hope finally arrives in the form of Ikros rushing to her rescue, who is immediately defeated in the exact same way. Honestly, the only reason Chaos didn't flat out annihilate them with just one of her abilities is that Astria was in on the whole thing, and this is when she decides to switch sides. So, Astria shows up and breaks her own chain, which, as I mentioned last time, is fucking awesome, and prompts Chaos to ask her if that was an example of love. She says that she doesn't know, but it's something that she decided to do for herself. So, they fight for a bit, but it's clear that Astria has zero chance of winning until Ikaro swoops back in with the Urana system, having self-repaired. But even Ikaros, 
previously and continuously established as the strongest angeloid in existence prior to this, even when in a fair fight, or hell, even when in a two-to-one fight, realizes quickly there is no way in hell they can beat Chaos. So instead of trying in vain to fight her, she remembers the one weakness of all angeloids, water, and rockets them both forward into the sea, successfully trapping Chaos at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. But despite water also being previously established as the kryptonite of angeloids, even the deepest point of our ocean isn't enough to so much as scratch Chaos. All it does is just keep her from moving due to the water pressure. But for now at least, everyone's safe. So, that was Chaos's first appearance in the anime, and just from that general recap, you might have gone, wait, that's it? They spend three episodes hyping up a major new bad guy and she's dispatched within a single fight scene? Well, no, because Chaos is actually a huge part of the rest of the story. Actually, scratch that. She basically is the rest of the story. We're not even remotely done with her. In episode 9, we see Chaos at the bottom of the ocean, reflecting on what Ikaros told her as they were sinking. You see, Ikaros had no idea what love was, but she said that when she spent time with Tomoki, it made her reactor hurt, and wondered if that was love. And Chaos, being a psychotic killing machine, interprets this to mean that love is the same thing as pain. She uses her wings to start killing the fish around her, saying, Did you know, Mr. Fishy? This is love! And vows to escape the ocean and teach that to everyone. <laughs> so, Right here is where the timeline split, right after this scene. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to keep covering Chaos's arc for a while in the manga, just for a bit, just to show you where it goes, and then after that we'll switch back to Forte and see how that wrapped up. So we actually don't hear from Chaos in the manga for another 15 chapters or so, which is just long enough to make you think Sumonazuki forgot about her. Then in chapter 45, Ikaros and Tomoki are hanging over the ocean for reasons I don't have time to cover right now, and we cut to Daedalus in Synapse, receiving an alert that an angeloid is 8,000 meters below them, which should be impossible since angeloids aren't able to survive in water. Well, it turns out that Minos has finally created the very first waterproof angeloid, the second generation marine warfare angeloid, Type Eta Siren and he plans to have her kill both Ikros and Tomoki by dragging them down into the depths of the sea. They don't know it's coming. They're completely helpless. Daedalus is begging him to stop, but he won't listen, and Minos gives Siren the order, kill them both, and then... stab! So, it turns out Chaos is still in this story, as she uses her liquid metal wings to murder the shit out of Siren. Siren begs Minos to help, but despite him repeatedly ordering Chaos to stop, she won't listen. And again, Angeloid, her not listening to orders is like fucking unheard of. So Chaos kills Siren and uses the self-evolution program Pandora, the existence of which the manga has sort of been building up for a while now, and absorbs her core and abilities, gaining the imperfect variable wings Amphibian and evolving into Chaos version 2, as Mino screams that she can no longer be stopped by anyone! Ah! 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 Okay, a, a few things. First of all, I love how Sumonazuki spends the whole back half of this chapter building up Siren like she's the new big baddie. Oh shit guys, it's Siren, look out for dead. She is literally in the manga for less than five pages, I love it. Second of all, holy shit, look at Chaos version 2's wings. I'm over here practically jizzing myself about how fucking awesome that shit is. Third, holy shit again, we saw how unimaginably powerful Chaos was previously, and now she's not only twice as strong, but not even weak to her kryptonite anymore. She is going to murder the shit out of everyone trying to teach them all what love is. 
I mean, they could barely fight her to a draw last time, and now she's even more powerful. What the hell are they gonna do? Well, it helps that Chaos doesn't find any of the Angeloids first. She finds Tomoki. She has a random cat with her that she's squeezing to death, telling Tomoki that, Don't you see? This is love! Until he, and keep in mind, not knowing she is literally, actually the most dangerous thing in the universe right now, hits her over the head with a newspaper and goes, Hey, don't bully the cat! Which is just, aw, oh, it, it's the perfect way to take the steam out of her character, it's wonderful. Chaos, understandably confused by this, asks what love is then if not pain, and Tomoki doesn't know how to answer that question. So the both of them spend the chapter going around together as he tries to teach her what love is in the most Tomoki way possible. So the joke here is that Tomoki will do something like spy on girls changing and go, look, that's love over there, and then get beat up for it, prompting Chaos to go, oh, so pain is love. So that repeats itself a few times, but eventually, after a day of making no progress with her, he notices something... odd. Chaos doesn't... She doesn't have any shoes. Tomoki says that it's too dangerous for a little girl like her to be running around barefoot, and so he offers his shoes to her. Chaos takes them, thinks for a moment, and asks, Is this love? Tomoki is speechless, so Chaos repeats the question. Is this love? He pauses, thinks for a moment in turn, and says, Hmm, yeah, I guess you could call that love. Chaos stops again, looks down, and with a big smile turns to him and goes, Okay, and Tomoki breathes a sigh of relief. Chaos says, Hey big brother, I want more love! But Tomoki notices how late it's gotten, and tells her to go home for the night, and they'll meet tomorrow to play more then. As he's walking away, Chaos quietly wonders, Where is my home? Synapse? Right, I should go back to where Master is. She blasts off, and we cut to Minos watching Chaos approaching Synapse on a monitor, as he yells, FIRE! Chaos is blindsided by the ultimate air defense system, Zeus, the most powerful weapon in all of Synapse, which is actually, surprisingly, enough to do a bit of damage to this elder god. Chaos meekly asks, What are you doing? And Minos replies, Chaos, you're going to be disposed of, as he fires off another volley of Zeus. Chaos asks again and again to be let in, trying to tell him that he's mistaken, trying to tell him that pain isn't love and that she's finally come home. But Minos yells, Shut up! You bore your fangs against the synapse, as if there would ever be a single place in the world for you! Chaos looks at Zeus charging up another shot, over at the harpies coming to attack her, and back down at the shoes, and runs. So, Chaos is walking through the streets of Sarami, still beat to shit from Zeus, until she sees the cat from earlier. She bends down next to it and says, Come over here. I've learned some things about love. But the cat just bites her hand and runs away. As Chaos is standing there, completely dejected, Hayori... Oh, right, yeah. That's Hayori, by the way. We'll talk more about her in part 8. Hayori comes over to her in a panic, asking, What happened to you? Where's your mother? Where's your home? Chaos pauses to consider this, and remembers Minos saying, As if there would be a single place in the world for you! And shaking, she says that her home is where Big Brother is. Where Big Brother is! And blasts off. Unfortunately, Chaos's panic attack happens to coincide with the standard hijinks that have been occurring simultaneously at Tomoki's house, with Nymphanastria getting into a fight about something stupid and Tomoki getting blown up, and she just happens to arrive right as Tomoki is kicking them out of the house and yelling, You angel itch, just buzz off and not come back! Chaos breaks. She says, It hurts. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts. 
Why does it hurt? Oh, Big Brother was lying to me. So love is pain after all. Chaos takes off again, but Astria gives chase. She begs Chaos to slow down and give her a chance to talk, but Chaos retaliates by blasting her instead. Love is pain! It all makes sense now! More! More! I'll grow bigger and give you lots of love! But I don't need it! I don't need something like love! And she dives into the ocean all the while still holding the fucking... The fucking shoes! You need to understand, I don't really cry at media that often. There are a few notable exceptions, like Madoka got me once, Kaon got me twice, Undertale got me twice, which is all very impressive, mind you, but SNO got me like seven goddamn separate times. Now, a few of those are easy to explain. One was during the credits of episode 12, as discussed previously. Another was at the ending of the manga in general. But the other five can be narrowed down to chaos and the fucking shoes. Every time I see chaos holding those fucking shoes, I tear up like a baby. Hell, every time I even think about chaos and the shoes, I just start to break down. And why? Well, to understand that, you need to understand Chaos's character. And to explain Chaos's character, I'm gonna have to make the single nerdiest comparison in the history of humanity. So, anyone here remember Animorphs? Personally, I haven't read it in years and I've forgotten like 90% of everything that happens, but one of the things about the series that I do remember, and what's relevant here, is one of the alien species, the Howlers. The thing about them is that they're these evil, horrible monsters, even one of which is strong enough to fight and easily defeat all the main characters at once. But after a few books, we find out a secret about the Howlers that they aren't actually evil. And far from it, in fact. Because the thing is, they're just animals who aren't smart enough to realize all the terrible things they're being used for, because each of them is like one or two years old and thinks all the brutal fighting and killing they do is just play. Like a bunch of puppies fighting each other, just capable of way more damage. They're not evil, they just don't know any better, and their puppeteers are taking advantage of that. The Howlers always reminded me of Chaos. Chaos was created by Minos, essentially as a Terminator. She was born into this world a weapon, and only did evil things because she didn't have the necessary context to discern right from wrong. Like you saw, the second she had a good influence around, her worldview did a 180 practically on the spot. But prior to that, all she knew how to do was how to hurt and how to kill. Chaos was a tool built and brainwashed to do one specific thing very well. Destroy. She didn't choose to be the bad guy. That decision was made for her. And what's even more depressing than that is imagining what would have happened if Chaos had successfully just killed everyone. Minos would have just gotten rid of her afterwards because she was just a tool built to do one specific job. Chaos was just born into a bad situation, and it was almost preordained that she wouldn't get the chance to break out of it. But just once, someone showed her the smallest bit of real, genuine kindness. Sakurai fucking Tomoki treated her like just another person, rather than something to be feared or used, and gave Chaos the one thing she had never had, a chance. All of which is embodied in the fucking shoes. So this moment where Chaos is breaking down, screaming that she doesn't need love, all the while clutching the only real bit of love she's ever gotten in her life as tightly to her chest as possible, I just... I can't handle it. The shoes embody the tragedy of Chaos's character and have all the emotions and struggles of her arc bundled into them, which is why it makes me so emotional just to see them. And for the record, 
Tomoki gives Chaos the shoes in chapter 46, about halfway through the manga, and for the entire rest of the story, every single time you see Chaos, in every chapter, on every page, in every panel, whether it's a tiny detail in the middle of an action scene or the main focus of the shot, you will never see Chaos without the shoes. It is a constant punch to the gut reminder of just how amazing a character she is, and just how good Suma Nozuki is at writing. And all of these elements combine together in such a way that it makes both Chaos and her arc one of my favorite stories in anything. Now, as much as it pains me to do this, I am gonna have to stop here. As I said, Chaos is integral to the plot of SNO from here on out, and her character arc lasts until the last pages of the final chapter. So if I kept talking about her, I would literally just end up reading the rest of the manga to you. Not to mention, Hayori is about to become very important to Chaos's arc. 
I was able to sort of gloss over her earlier, but we'll need to talk more about her in my review of the movie before we can go much further into the story. The important thing is, though, that you now have a pretty decent understanding of Chaos's character and just what makes her so incredible. In the manga, anyways. So, to talk about the ending of Forte, we're gonna need to rewind. Before Chaos went off the deep end, before Zeus, before the shoes, before the self-evolution program Pandora, before Siren, all the way to right here. It's episode 9. Chaos has just finished her initial fight with Icaros and is trapped at the bottom of the ocean. It's at this point that AIC Asta and Kadokawa make two major changes to the plot of the manga. One of which is sort of bad and only really annoys me on a personal level, and the other of which actively doomed the franchise. But I have one last thing to bring up before we can really dig into what happened to Forte. We need to understand why those two changes were made in the first place. Basically, it has to do with two things. How the manga was structured, and how the anime decided to adapt it. So, for context... Episode 9 adapts chapter 32 of the manga, which is kinda awkward timing, because it's basically in between two really big arcs, Chaos's and Hayori's, and chapter 34 is the beginning of Hayori's arc, which has already been pre-chosen as the plotline for the first movie that they would announce at the ending of episode 12. So, basically, they needed to pull three episodes worth of filler out of their ass to fill from episode 10 to episode 12. But, it would probably be underwhelming for the second season of our action series that only have one major fight scene halfway through and then just kind of fuck around for the last five episodes. But, the manga also doesn't lend itself to any convenient one-off villains to cram in for an exciting finale, because Suma Nozuki doesn't do one-off villains. Everything and every character in the manga is interconnected and absolutely crucial to the story. So... What do? Well, first we need to sort out the filler, which you'd think would be easy enough, right? Just grab a random handful of comedy chapters from the manga and shuffle them around a bit, exactly like they had done a billion times before. Well, for some reason, known only to the gnomes that live inside the writer's heads, they decide not to do that incredibly obvious thing. Instead, they decide to make shit up. So, Episode 9 has Mikiko holding one of her tournaments, in which all the girls have been tied up and thrown into a pool. Whichever tag team is able to catch the girl with the biggest tits wins a million dollar prize. So Mikiko spends a while kicking Tomoki's ass, and after Astria gets snagged, it looks like there's no one left with big enough tits for them to win. But Suguta says, I've heard tale of a legend. A legend of a girl with such ginormous tits that she would easily win us the competition and who sleeps at the bottom of the sea. And the joke is that it's Sahora, right? Well, suddenly, we cut from the tournament stage to Tomoki and Sugurta being on a raft in the middle of the ocean. And just as Tomoki's about to jump into the water after her, he tells Sugurta, Hey, when I get back, I'm gonna propose to Ikaros, and then dives into the water after his prize. And so Hora Karate chops the shit out of him. And this scene is obviously not actually happening, right? Like, we're in Sumanazuki over-the-top comedy land right now, not reality. They're not actually in the ocean, and Tomoki saying that he was going to propose is literally just the joke of a character saying, Hey, I've only got two days left until retirement, right before they get killed, right? Well, it is in the manga, but in the anime, they decide to make this scene canon, somehow. Because suddenly after the tournament's over, Ikaros remembers that this happened and starts saying he was going to propose to me? Which makes zero sense, because this plotline is predicated on a comedy scene, which the show has conditioned us to accept aren't happening in actuality. And that springboards off into this whole other separate plotline of them arranging a mock marriage ceremony where Tomoki has to pick a girl to date, which doesn't add or change anything about his relationship with any of the characters, and so is completely pointless, and it's all just so fucking stupid. 
I've talked before about how good SNO is at switching between comedy and drama, and here we get a wonderful example of just how easy it is for shitty writers to fuck up doing that, as you can physically hear the gears shift, stall, and finally shatter as the story breaks itself apart. So, that's the filler worked out in the worst way possible, but who, oh who, to bring in for the final boss fight? <laughs> No. No! No! No, 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 no! They can't! No! 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 How? I... Why? I just... I can't believe it. I cannot fucking believe it. Chaos is back. She's... She, she's back and she's old now? She's fucking... She, she, she's back, you guys. She's back. No, she, she's back. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, yeah. You know what? Fuck it. I'll play. Okay, so, Chaos is back. Early. Like, way too fucking early. Like, stillbirth early. So, um, this leaves me with just a few questions. Like, um, how? You see, I ask, because in the manga, you might have heard of it, there was, like, a reason for it, you know? She killed an aquatic angeloid and absorbed her powers with Pandora, which let her escape the ocean. But, uh, Siren wasn't in the anime, nor has Pandora been at all introduced, so, uh, how? Oh, well, don't you fucking worry. There will be no lost sleep on Forte's watch, because there is a fucking reason. You want to know what it fucking is? You're gonna... This is just... This is gold, so get ready. Uh, can, can I get, like, a drum roll, please? This really does need some build-up. There we go. So, the reason Chaos was able to overcome the angeloid kryptonite to escape the deepest darkest depths of the ocean, the reason she now has the body of a full-grown woman, and the catalyst for the entire ending of season two is... She ate some fish. She ate some fish. She ate some fish. She ate some... No, you don't fucking understand! She ate some fish. She ate some fish. She ate... Some fish. She fucking ate some fucking fish. In the arms of an angel, fly away from here. From this awful shitty season, and the riders with heads up their rear. Oh my god. Oh my god! How the fuck do you make this up? Well, I can tell you! You see, back at the ending of episode 9, you'll recall that Chaos comes to the conclusion that pain is love, and started shopping up all the fish around her, saying, Don't you know, Mr. Fishy? This is love! I'm gonna eat lots and get bigger, and then I'll teach everyone what love really is! Now in the manga, which was written by a competent person, we see Chaos while killing Siren say, I ate a lot, so many, but fish really aren't good enough, so give it to me, your power! But in the anime, which was written by syphilitic monkeys, nope, fish are fine, apparently. I just can't, I can't even, holy shit. Okay, number fucking one. It is established in episode two of Forte that, and I am quoting here, angeloids don't age. We see Ikros has been along since at least the Tower of Babel from the Old Testament. So if we're following Christianity's timeline, that puts her at at least 5,000 years old, but all of them are probably much, much older. So if angeloids don't age, then how the fuck did Chaos grow older? Also, why the fuck are her tits hanging out now? I don't know about you, but when I looked at the poor, sweet, innocent, cinnamon bun of a character that was Chaos, being brutally, physically, and emotionally tortured, my first thought was not, 
ah, but what would her tits look like? And I'm a fucking lolicon! Number fucking two! Even if we accept the idea that she could go from, like, 8 to 25 by eating fish for a few days, that wouldn't suddenly make her immune to water, what the fuck? So, yeah, chaos is back, and it makes zero sense. But that's okay, because it makes all the other changes look less stupid by comparison. Like, Ikaros loses her memory at one point, which is fucking retarded, but who cares? There's a scene where Tomoki goes in person to meet Daedalus in the Synapse, which isn't supposed to happen until the very last chapter of the manga, but I can't even pretend I'm angry about that bullshit. Because Chaos coming back by eating fish is such a black hole of miserable failure that nothing else can even possibly compare. So, Chaos comes back, and she's, like, affecting the weather somehow. No, I mean, it makes sense. Apparently just a new power she gained after eating all those fish. I mean, we were stupid enough to keep watching after this. After fucking this. All the smart people already fucked off to the manga, so anyone left will just accept anything at this point, right? So, she shows up, and there's that fight scene they wanted so desperately they willingly threw away the best character in the manga for it. Tomoki visits Daedalus, and despite the fact he should be asking her a million questions right now, he doesn't. She gives him a fucking... thing? And says that when he puts it on Chaos, it'll turn her good. So everyone has a big dumb fight scene, and eventually Chaos loses. Which shouldn't fucking happen ever, because even if she didn't get a power upgrade in the anime like she did in the manga, her base form was still unstoppably strong, but what the fuck ever, Chaos loses, somehow. Then Tomoki walks up to her, puts the thing on her, and BAM! She's a good guy now. And they all live happily ever after. The end. Oh, how is this the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life? Let me count the ways. Number one, you have completely buttfucked Chaos's story. Chaos's arc is supposed to be about an unfortunate girl who was predestined to be a weapon, meaning a good influence in turning her life around. It mirrors Ikaros' arc in that way, except Chaos is considerably more unfortunate and has to struggle through a lot more hardship to reach the same place, as tragic circumstance upon tragic circumstance conspired to keep her in a perpetual state of emotional torment. But, you know, who cares about any of that, am I right? Number two! You buttfucked Chaos' story in a way that removes everything that made it good. This ending strips Chaos of everything that made her an interesting character and a threatening villain. Chaos in the manga was a veritable god among men, who still came across as sympathetic, tragic, and vulnerable, and who acted in evil ways while still having understandable motives and goals. I mean, you saw how emotional I got talking about the shoes earlier, and they just don't exist in the anime. Never come up, not a thing that happens. And not only is that major plotline completely removed, but they never bother actually teaching Chaos what love is in the anime. And why would we? She's just magically good now, because our view of morality is so dirt fucking simple that way. We don't have to bother fixing this major crippling personality flaw, the MacGuffin did it for us. So, in the anime, Chaos doesn't have to go through a struggle to change. There was no payoff, no catharsis, no pathos, no nothing. We just put a fucking thing on her, and pfft, she's a good guy now, I guess. Number three, you didn't just buttfuck Chaos's story, but the entire rest of the story. Because Chaos's story basically is the entire rest of the story. Chaos is the main antagonist. Chaos is the one who kills Hayori. Chaos is the one who almost kills Tomoki. Chaos is the one who decided to destroy the universe by activating the rule. And without her, none of it can possibly happen! This one change has irrevocably fucked the entire anime story going forward. Now, that doesn't matter so much when you're adapting Hiyori's arc, which didn't have Chaos present in the first place, but when you're adapting, oh, for the sake of fucking example, the ending of the fucking manga, an event for which Chaos is both the catalyst and key antagonist, then suddenly, K 
chaos gets pretty fucking important. Fuck you! I honestly, truly don't think I have ever hated anything more in my life than I hate what they did to Chaos. They flat out ruined not just my favorite character from the manga, but one of my favorite characters in all of fiction. Just shout out pure solidified contempt onto her character and rub their balls over anyone who ever cared about the story, whoever gave a crap about SNO, and all so they can have a fucking fight scene. I honestly just like to pretend this ending never happened. It's how I cope. That's why I tell everyone to stop watching at episode 9. Just for the chance, just for the off chance that they'll listen, that they'll save themselves. It just, it ruins everything! It ruins her character, it ruins her arc, it ruins your suspension of disbelief, the quality of the writing, the consistency of the show, and the entire rest of the story. It's the metastasized cancer that infects everything, every plot, every character, and every arc. It's what turns the anime into a rotting zombie, reduced to only a shadow, to only a pale imitation of its former self. It's just the biggest possible betrayal. And that's really the hardest thing, is being a loyal fan and having lived through all of this, having been betrayed like this is how completely it ruins every possible shred of hope I could have for this franchise. Like, they announce a new movie, and for half a second my heart leaps. But what should be a monumentous occasion is just as quickly ruined by the knowledge that unless they retcon Forte, which they won't, there's nothing they can do. That'll just suck too. It'll just be more shit on the pile. I mean, people keep going on and on about a possible season 3, which will never happen anyway, but even if it did, they already ruined chaos. They already ruined the story. The only thing a potential season 3 could do at this point is just take another crap on the show's legacy. It is now impossible for me to be excited about anything in this franchise ever again. Because from now on, even if the legs twitch, even if it makes a brief gasp for air, for whatever appearance of life, it's already dead. Chaos in the anime never learnt that love isn't pain, but that actually makes a weird kind of sense to me. Because loving the SNO anime is about the most painful thing I can possibly imagine. Continued in part 8.